I've been living with that passage for a couple of weeks now. And uh, even when Nellie's reading it, it's like, oh, yes, awesome. <laughs> There's a sense in which it, that's what I want to do. I want us to go through that passage, work through it together, and think and consider it, really have it impact us. Turn with me in your pew Bibles um, to Luke chapter 5. That's Luke chapter 5. We're going to be camped out there. In most of your pew Bibles, it is page 855. Luke chapter 5. In, the, in our Spanish, English uh, Bibles that are uh, the first thing you, come, you can see on the way coming into the sanctuary, they are page 1,532. So Luke chapter 5. This morning we're going to be considering together that incident that, we did, that Ellie just read for us of Jesus healing the paralyzed man. It's a fascinating story. And it, it, it occurs in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to be spending our time in Luke, uh, though there's a couple of details that Mark preserves for us that, that are quite important that I'll be bringing into my, to my story here. <clears throat> um, Jesus was a healer and a miracle worker. That much is absolutely clear from the gospel narratives. He was a healer and miracle worker. As a matter of fact, that's even confirmed by other sources, like uh, you know, rabbinic sources, not Christian truth sources. They recognize that Jesus had miraculous powers. Okay, um, he was known for this. But there's something curious about his healings. If you if you start taking them all in, um, he would oftentimes engage with people in conversation. Uh, he wanted, it's like he wanted to know what their real need was, even beyond, beyond, uh, you know, the, the simple physical ailment that they were having. Think about, there's a few, you know, incidents. For example, his, the Syrophoenician woman comes to him, her daughter is sick. And there's a, there's a kind of repartee back and forth between Jesus and this woman. Very interesting. He's getting to know her. That's what she's all about. Uh, think about, um, uh, think about the, the centurion who comes to Jesus because his, his servant is sick. And Jesus talks with him, and the man expresses so much faith that Jesus said, I've never seen such faith, he, even in Israel, that this man has, faith in him. And then think about the, think about the ten lepers that Jesus healed. Jesus healed ten lepers, sent them on their way to get checked out by the authorities, they started on their way, but one of them turned back to thank Jesus. And uh, Jesus recognized this, and he said, well, didn't I heal ten? How come only one came back? You see, Jesus is interested in what's going on inside of a person. There are deeper issues than simply physical healing. Uh, maybe the greatest example I have is, you remember Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus from Jericho, right? He, he, he's sitting by the side of the road, probably begging. Uh, he hears that Jesus is coming by. Jesus and his entourage of disciples. And, and he starts crying out. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus, Jesus hears him. And he says, bring him to me. And they say, hey, Bartimaeus, Jesus is calling for you. Come on, come on, let's go. And he, they bring Bartimaeus up to Jesus. And Jesus said, he's a blind man. Jesus says to him, what can I do for you? Okay. He's a blind man, isn't it obvious? But no, you see, see, Jesus is interested in something deeper than, now, it's, it's a little bit like, in that moment, it's a little bit like uh, you know, the, the picture of, you, you've smashed up your car. You're dropping, you're, it's, it's being lowered, uh, you know, uh, onto the property of an auto body shop. The auto body shop man comes out and says, what can I do for you? Well, isn't it obvious? Okay, isn't it obvious? I'm blind. My car's wrecked. Okay, but why is Jesus doing this? He's interested in in things that are actually deeper. He's interested in us as whole people, and not just physical ailments, as important as those are. So we need to be alert to that fact, um, even when, when we're looking at this particular passage. So let's start as we turn to. Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 17. One day, while Jesus was teaching, 
Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Okay. So what, here, here's, the, here's the scene. Jesus, just shortly before this, uh, was baptized. The heavens were opened. The spirit was, was uh, poured out on him. And he entered the public arena for the first time. And he, one of the things he does, he goes to Nazareth and he proclaims. He says, he reads from the, from, from the book of Isaiah and he tells, he tells the audience, today, in my reading, here and now, this is being fulfilled. We're talking about miraculous signs. We're talking about the good news preached to the poor. We're talking about the kingdom of God coming. It's happening right now in my ministry. And so he goes from there, he's, he, he, uh, he starts healing people, casting out demons. And, you know, it's, you know strong signs like this. And, and at this particular moment, as we get to Luke chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus is teaching. He happens to be teaching inside a house, which is unusual. Usually we think about Jesus outside, you know, break crowds, but he's inside today. And he's, uh, and we're told, we're told by, uh, by Luke that the power to heal was strongly with Jesus. So that's a clue to what's going to happen. Let's read, pick it up again on uh, uh, verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up uh, to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Oh. So imagine, imagine yeah. that scene with us. Think about the paralyzed man for a moment. I'm going to call him Joe. Okay, we're not giving his name to Joe because it's short for Joseph. It's a, a fine a biblical name. Joe has been paralyzed, probably for some time. We don't know if he was a paraplegic. We don't know if he was a quadriplegic. Uh, it, it, I think it's useful to think. We don't know if he, if he got this way by some kind of accident, like happened to our friend Johnny of Johnny and Friends. Okay? Um, in any case, his, he had no, no means to get around except to be carried. Uh, so his family and friends, now, his family and friends, they hear that Jesus, the healer, this miracle worker, is going to be in Capernaum, in the town of Capernaum. And now, we don't know, we don't know how far away they came, but they said, they said, uh, um, they said to, um, to Joe, they said, look, we know Jesus is here. This is the one that's been healing people, casting out demons, and preaching the good news. He's here in the city of Capernaum. Shall we go to him? What do you think, Joe? The four, the four of them, the four of them decide this. And, and Joe says, Joe's response is, yes, get me to Jesus. Okay? And now we don't know how far they traveled. It could have been some distance. We, uh, you know, it could have been another village, a few villages away. They are carrying him. Each one has a corner of the kind of a stretcher that he's on. Each one of them is carrying, and they may have calloused hands at this point. Their hopes are high that they're going to see Jesus. And they, when they get when they get to Capernaum, they say, "Oh, he's he's down the road." Turns out he's teaching. He's teaching inside a house. And at first they're disappointed because the house is jam packed. Okay, it's jam packed with people. There are there are Jesus' disciples there. There are religious leaders, as we've heard, there. There are other onlookers there. And it is so crowded, you know, you know how it gets? There are people standing in the doorway. You know, like multiple heads deep in the doorway. And um, the house was swamped with people, okay? And, and there were relig the religious leaders were there. What are they doing? They're, they're kind of evaluating Jesus. They're evaluating Jesus. Is you've heard about this rabbi. Thumbs up, thumbs down, we'll see. But that doesn't matter so much right now to Joe and his friends. What are they going to do? They look around. And they hatch a plan, okay? Joe has some clever friends. Hard-working friends. 
Okay. They had some plans. I said, Joe, what do you think? What do you think if we get you up on the roof? We break through the roof and we lower you right down in front of Jesus. Okay? We're going to get you to Jesus. What do you think, Joe? Uh, Joe says, let's do it. Get me to Jesus. Now, homes at that time in Capernaum, were, well, most of them were, were two floors. There was the main floor. This is the space that Jesus was teaching in. Rather much more modest than this, of course. But, but the second floor was actually the roof. The roof was used for certain activities, for work, uh, for storage, uh, for you could sleep up there on hot summer nights, too. Okay? The roof itself was made of, of wood and branches and thatch and mud and tile. Okay, so so it was it was a constructed roof, and so these guys are saying, "Look, we're gonna we're gonna go up there, okay. we'll go up to the roof, and we're gonna dig down into it." Okay, and uh, on the outside of the houses, the outside would be either a, a ladder or right uh, right built right into the house, a kind of stone steps go leading up on the outside to to the roof. So that's. That's what they, that's what they, deserve. now imagine that situation. Joe says, let's do it. And the friends do it. They get him up there first. Imagine they get him up there. That's hard enough. And then they start digging through that roof. Imagine that situation, okay? Maybe from, from if you were in that room with Jesus, listening to him teach. You start to hear <laughs> footsteps above you, right? You hear kind of like a crew talking to each other. <laughs> then you start to hear digging. Things being moved around. Maybe a light starts. To, to, the dirt's falling down <laughs> in front, you know? And at some point, at some point, Jesus must have stopped teaching, right? I mean, if that happened here, you know, at some point, even Pastor Ray would stop. And look, what is going on? And it, 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 Jesus and the rest are looking up, and they start to see faces up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then the hole gets big enough. And they start letting this man down, their friend Joe, down on ropes right in front of Jesus. Okay. Wow, what a scene. Now that's that's dedication, isn't it? That's dedication, friends. You know, and that's that's faith. You know, um, you know, friends do what they can to get people to Jesus, don't they? That's the friends did that this day. That, and they showed faith. Joe showed faith. That's what faith looks like for Joe and his friends that day. Okay, it was demonstrated. Now, faith looks different, I think, to different people. Okay, de depending on our personality types. And, uh, and you know, let me give you an example. I, we've got, my wife and I have dear friends, Robin and Eric. They are both Christians. One of them, Robin, has very simple, almost childlike trust and love for Jesus. She just exudes it all the time. And uh, that's, that's faith for her, for her personality type. Eric is, is almost the, the opposite in this way. He's always struggling with doubt and evidence and arguments. And he's, he and I are constantly talking. And, it's, and of course, I want him. I, I try and hope that he'll get to the point of a more uh, joyful, simple trust in Jesus. But what I've told him recently is, Eric, you know, maybe this is what faith looks like for you. Struggling with these things, constantly thinking about Jesus, working on it, trying to get to Jesus that way. I think it is for some of our personalities. Faith, that's what faith means. We want to get to Jesus. We want to get our friends to Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Let's go to verse 20 in, in Luke chapter 5. Verse 20. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. Now, is that... Is that what you were expecting Jesus to say? I, I, don't, I, I don't think I would have expected Jesus to say that, okay? 
and again, it's a middling, you know, uh, the wrecker is dropping off your car at the auto body shop, it's all wrecked up, and the guy coming out, the owner of the shop is saying, what can I do for you? Right? This is, why is Jesus saying this? Um, I think there's two reasons. First, first of all, Jesus is looking deeper into this man's soul, and he knows <coughs> what Joe really needs. He knows the deepest needs of this man. Okay? And it is more than physical healing, as serious as that was. He, Joe needs to experience the forgiveness of God. And so, with joy, with joy, Jesus sees this man, and he announces to him that his sins are forgiven. And there was no, no indication that Joe was particularly sinful. He's a regular human being. And he, this, is a, this is an indication about our, our general human condition. You know, we are all sinners. Okay? We all are in desperate need of forgiveness. We have all done things that are wrong. We have failed to do things that are right. We have said wrong things. We have thought wrong things. We are all naturally in desperate need of forgiveness. We are like Job in that way. And where can we find this forgiveness? Turn, we turn to Jesus as the source of forgiveness. When Job gets to Jesus, he gets forgiveness. And that's, that's true with us as well. That's how our sins are forgiven. Okay. When we come to Jesus... Now, maybe our friends are, are digging through a roof and dropping us down in front of Jesus. But by hook or by crook, when we get to Jesus by faith, that's where we get our sins forgiven. He has the power and authority to forgive sins. The, the scripture says, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then and all of that, all of that is based flows from the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. On the cross. Now you might say, because you're sharp, you're perceptive, you're thinking, you're thinking with me, you might say, Pastor Ray, wait a minute. Jesus, uh, Job didn't ask to be forgiven, right? And Jesus hadn't even died on the cross yet. Okay? How could Job's sins be forgiven before that? And it, it is true that Jesus had not yet died on the cross. However, we need to understand, his entire ministry was played out under the shadow of the cross. That is where he was heading. When he was teaching, when he was healing, his destination ultimately was to be crucified. Okay? And so that, that, uh, that was his choice, that was his destiny, that was what he embraced. And the forgiveness that flowed from the cross flowed into his ministry, and even before it. You see, Scripture tells us that animal sacrifices can't cleanse from sin. It's only the blood of the cross. So the cross kind of stands in the middle of time, and any forgiveness of God that has been enjoyed and experienced by humanity before the cross or after the cross still flows from that monument. It flows from that monument, and that's what um, and that what was that's what was happening here. It flows both forward and backward in time. Jesus' entire ministry was conducted under the shadow of the cross. Um, in his earthly ministry, we see Jesus as I think it's helpful to see as as the the walking forgiveness of God. You see. The way people responded to him, when they responded positively to Jesus, forgiveness was transmitted. That's, that's how, uh, they, that's what we see. For example, even the um, two chapters later in Luke, we have that amazing account, perhaps you'll remember it, where Jesus is sitting in the house, uh, having dinner uh, uh, in the house of Simon uh, the, um, uh, the Pharisee. He's sitting, sitting there talking with Simon, and a woman comes in from the street. Okay? A woman known publicly for, for her sinful behavior. She knows that Jesus is there. She is drawn to him. 
She, she needs Jesus. She has to see Jesus. So she goes in. And she sits behind him. His feet are out on the side. She begins to weep, to wet his feet with, with, her, with her tears, and to dry them with her hair. And she, this, she's responding to Jesus. She's getting forgiveness. And this is where Jesus says to Simon, he says, you see this woman here? The great love that she is showing to me proves that her sins are forgiven. Okay? Okay? That's what's happening here. Joe is coming to Jesus. He gets, in the package, he gets his, his sins forgiven. He didn't articulate those words, I confess this. Or, neither did the woman. Coming to Jesus in desperation, we get forgiveness. He's the source. So Job, like Job, the paralytic, the sinful woman, does not ask for forgiveness in so many words. They receive it nonetheless because of their response to Jesus. Now, I said that the first reason for Jesus to tell Job that his sins were for forgiveness is because he knew the real needs of Job and every other human being. That is to be reconciled with God by having their sins forgiven. That's, that's one reason. Okay, that's one reason. But there's another reason as well. There's a second one in that situation. Uh, um, looking around him, Jesus sees that he is being in, evaluated and inspected by the religious crew. Right? Okay. Religious scholars and religious people of his day. He's, in a sense, he's on a job interview. Right? At least in their mind. They're there. I don't know. What do you think about this guy? Kind of a thing. Uh, he's, he's defending his dissertation. He's having his plant inspection inspected by OSHA. <laughs> his, his company is trying to get to meet the ISO standards. Of course, you are your best behavior, right? Well, will Jesus be on his best behavior? Don't count on it. <laughs> okay? Don't count on it. Jesus is going to use this very moment to, as a teaching tool to proclaim a vital truth to the to to the community there. Okay, again, he could have tailored his message, made it nice and safe for the religious crowd there, just to impress. You know, he, he could have. You know, maybe they could go. Oh, so he's a good rabbi, a little unconventional, but he tells parables. He's very good, very very good. Um, but that would not have been the complete truth. You see, Jesus is not just a good teacher. He's not just a good rabbi. Uh, he is much more than that. He is God in the flesh. He is the very image of the invisible God. He is the divine agent who is bringing the kingdom of God, okay? causing it to break into time and space and transform the world. The way that he acted, the content of his message, both here in this house and elsewhere, simply does not leave us with the option of thinking of him as a good teacher okay? or even a good man. That option is not before us. We don't have that option. He is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, you may be familiar with this, Mahatma Gandhi was uh, talking to some Christian missionaries. Mahatma Gandhi was a um, Hindu leader in, uh, in India. And he said, he said to these Christian missionaries, he said, you know what? I like your Christ, but I don't, I don't like your Christians. Okay? Now, on one level, we know exactly what he means. Right? Christians fail all the time. Okay? If you didn't know that before, you just heard it from me, so you won't be surprised <laughs> next time you open your eyes. Christians fail all the time. However, I think ultimately, Mahatma Gandhi was completely wrong. Okay. He, he says, I like your Christ. I don't think so. If he met the Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus that, uh, that was present there in that room, he wouldn't have liked him. Okay. We don't have the like option for Jesus. It is liar, lunatic, or Lord. That's the, those are the options there. That's what we get when Jesus says this provocative thing. Young man, your sins are forgiven. Let's go to verse 21, which I just changed my page here. Here we go. 
Verse 21. How do, they, how do the religious leaders react? But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Who, who is this? That, that is indeed the million dollar question. That is the most important question in all the world. Who is Jesus? Mm -hmm. Understanding who he is and responding to him is, is vital. Now, blasphemy here, is he's, this is blasphemy. It, that is for a human person, a human being, to take divine prerogatives is blasphemy. Now, and to, and to declare a person forgiven, only God can do that. Now, God had said about certain things that you could do at that time, uh, to, you know, a certain sacrificial system in the temple there in Jerusalem. Some of these guys were from Jerusalem. They had a sacrificial system there. You anyway, you could... You could you could do the ritual, and you could get uh, relief from, from your sins, okay? But here, Jesus, apart from that sacrificial system, seemingly out of thin air, is simply de declaring this man to have his sins forgiven, that only God can do that. Now, Jesus perceived what they were thinking, this is a miraculous thing. You perceive what they were, th these are the thoughts that they were in their, in their mind. But also, also he had brought them to this point. This is part of the reason why he had said that to Job. Look at verse uh, 22 with me. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, um, he, he asks this question. He asks this question to the religious leaders, and really it's a question for all of us. Um, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or walk, stand, you know, uh, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, Bible students have scratched their heads on this riddle, okay? It's really, I don't think it's as, as hard as all that. You know, it's really like Jesus said, talk is cheap, right? Yeah. You know, it's easy to say both of those things. What's really is, who has the authority to say those things, yeah. okay? Who has the authority to have, to have to say those things and have it be real? And he says, he says, I'm going to prove to you that I have the authority to declare people forgiven. By causing this man to be miraculously healed. Okay? And so that's what he means when he says, here in this, when he says, um, So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to, to forgive sin. Now, the Son of Man is actually Jesus' favorite term for himself, Son of Man. And, and it seems like the reason is because it was a somewhat mysterious term, and he was able to, to, to put his own meaning into it. He, it, but he was the Messiah, but he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't usually use the word Messiah much for himself. Because there were preconceptions about exactly what a Messiah is going to do, and so on. So, so what he's saying, uh, so that you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He's talking about what he's about to do and say. Now... He will prove that he has the authority to forgive sins by a demonstrable and verifiable healing in their midst. Now, there is always a purpose to Jesus' miracles. Always. Okay. It, it, yes, of course, one is for God to have compassion and, and care and concern and to give relief to hurting human beings. Yes, that's one of them. But Jesus' miracles always point to something. To something. They point to himself as the king and the kingdom of God as breaking in through his ministry. Okay? So this is this is always something that we have to look at. Even the, the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have plenty of miracles. All, all lots of miracles that are described. The Gospel of John, and all of them point to Jesus. The Gospel of John has selected seven miracles and seven key ones that the author wants us to look at each one and reflect on 
What does it mean about Jesus? My gosh, Jesus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead from the dead. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so on. Up until the greatest miracle being Jesus' resurrection, where the right response, right response to that miracle is for us to say, with without formerly doubting, doubting Thomas, my Lord and my God. Mm-hmm. Okay? To Jesus. Alright, so this. Um, so look at verse 24. So, uh, sorry, the second half of verse 24. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. So there, imagine that situation. Disciples are there, potential critics, friends, looking down from the ceiling. <laughs> um, imagine the tension of that moment. Remember that Luke, now, Luke has already keyed us in that the power of the Lord was strongly with Jesus to heal. Okay. So he, Jesus tells Job, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And he does. Okay? He does. Um, imagine that moment. Imagine that man. Okay? Imagine that man standing up. At this point, he probably never felt the ground before. It's a, the whole thing is a miracle that he can walk even. He, and he picks up his he goes outside, he meets his friends who are basically running off of, off of the roof. Okay? There's absolute joy in those friends, you know, uh, that, that this has happened. There's joy. There's joy about the physical healing. And then, and then maybe a little later on, when Joe gets home, he realizes, oh yes, my sins are forgiven. My, his life was changed from that point on. He knows that. Look at verse, um, uh, look, look at verse 26 with me. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. For everyone there that day, you have to imagine the world was spinning. The, really, the world was spinning for them. They were stunned. They were amazed. They were in awe. Uh, um, it was now their responsibility, seeing what had happened, hearing what had happened, to recalculate, recalibrate their whole, their entire life. Okay? To say that the, all of a sudden, Jesus should be center in their lives. Everything now should be revolving around, around Jesus. He's the one who has the authority uh, to declare sins forgiven. He's the one that has this miraculous powers, this miraculous power. This miracle tells us something about him. Again, indeed, who is he? He is not just a wonder, wonder worker as, what, as important as it is. He is the one who has the authority to forgive sins. That's what we really need. That's what each one of us really needs. Some of us may need physical healing. All of every human being needs to know that their sins are forgiven. So, whether we are physically healthy or not, we all need our sins forgiven. How do we do that? I mean, one way would be to live back in you know, Capernaum and have your friends lower you down in front of Jesus. Seeing that that's kind of hard to do, <laughs> we, we have other ways to do that. We can come to Jesus by faith, right? Faith and trust. Jesus is alive right now. He's a resurrected Lord. He is alive and he's willing to declare the same thing to us if we come to, us, to, to him by faith, okay? I mean, the New Testament puts it in different ways. You know the famous verse, rightly famous verse, uh, so God, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's, we believe in him. We get to Jesus by faith. Just a couple of verses before that where Jesus says, he says, remember how Moses in the desert, he lifted up a, a bronze serpent and whoever looked at that image was healed. Remember that? Well, when the Son of Man is lifted up on the cross, 
Whoever believes in him or looks to him with faith will have their sins forgiven. They will be saved. That's what we do. Paul puts it a different way too, but the same thing. He says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Okay? That we, we, that's how we, today, we get to Jesus. That's how we do it. I, as the music ministry comes forward, I want to invite you, if you have already gotten yourself to Jesus, let's reaffirm that truth. If you, if you haven't gotten yourself to Jesus, first of all, I want to know about it today. I want you to come to see me after the service. But let's pray a prayer together. Essentially a we're getting ourselves to Jesus prayer. Let's do that. If you wouldn't would mind repeating after me. Lord Jesus, you are the one that has the authority to forgive sins. We turn to you. We place ourselves before you by faith. And we look to you and to your cross for our salvation. We look to you and your cross for our salvation. Transform our lives now, we pray, just like you did, Job's. Transform our lives now, we pray, just like you did, Job. Amen. 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 Very good. Another way, another way to get to Jesus, another way that it can be for you and me, is actually communion. Having communion, to, we, we practice communion here once a month. But let's, let's, let's do that today with intentionality. Let's do it today, uh, not as a ritual, but when you when you come out in your seat in a, in a few moments, when you come out in your seat and come, come forward, Pastor Joe is going to help me uh, serve uh, the communion. But um, when you come out of your seat, come out and say, in your mind, in your heart, I'm getting me to Jesus. Okay? And how appropriate that these are the very signs and symbols of Jesus' death on the cross and of his forgiveness extended to those who would believe, right? How appropriate. So come, well, in a moment, I'll ask you to come forward after I say the words of institution. Um, take, take the bread and take a cup. Uh, take, you can eat the bread at any moment you'd like, but if you wouldn't mind, hold the cup, which we'll, we'll kind of take together as I pray. But um, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Joe, would you come forward? Everybody, come on forward. Let's get yourself to Jesus.